Hearst Chapel at Western Reform Seminary at our new location here on the west side of Puyallup, well, Washington. And I want to just talk a little bit about our last five years when we were looking for a beautiful facility like this. And uh, we'll rehearse that and then we'll look at the scripture to uh, talk about God using a crooked stick to draw a straight line. And the crooked stick is Balaam, but God using Balaam as God's mouthpiece can give a uh, true, true uh, revelation and true theology. Uh, when we think of Samuel Morris, we don't think of him as uh, one of the best early American painters. Uh, he studied in England and then he studied in Paris and made copies of all the fine classic paintings in the Louvre in Paris. But uh, from his interaction of uh, being in England, but especially in Paris, he learned about uh, electromagnetism, and that's what got his interest in the telegraph um, possibilities. And he's one of the first, in, first to invent a telegraph. There were others also, but he gave us the Morse code, I'm talking about Samuel Morse. And when he sent his first message over his telegraph, it was a Bible phrase from the Balaam prophecies from Numbers chapter 23. And uh, the way the King James has it is, what hath God wrought? Question mark. And uh, it's what he was familiar with from the King James. And today our modern versions say, it's more like an exclamatory statement. In the proper time, the people will say, what has God wrought? And that's where we are today as we come to um, mark the granting of our occupancy permit, but also to have our first chapel here in this beautiful building and say, God has done it, and we are very satisfied with what God has done. Here's the, the rest of that verse in Numbers 23 and verse, verse uh, 23. There is no omen against Jacob. There is no divination against Israel. Nice to know that nobody can stick pins into our voodoo doll and make us squirm because God is sovereign. He's in control of everything that comes into our lives. He's working all things together for our good. But here's the rest of that verse 23 of Numbers 23. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel, what God has done. God has done some wonderful things for us at the proper time. And we see if we, we look back, we've got the hindsight, but for the last five years, we've been going by braille, just kind of feeling, let's see, it's our faith lays hold of God, Trust God for the future, and now God has unfolded for us in marvelous ways. And uh, five years ago, very mysterious, when a fire with smoke damage to the seminary uh, forced us out of our previous location five years ago. And so for five years now, we felt kind of like a wandering Aramean. We've been pilgrims for the last uh, five years. And we, we've always been trusting God by faith. We started in 1983. That was a work of faith. We didn't know where or how God would uh, provide and lead, but God has provided through all the years. And so that picture of uh, a wandering Aramean is the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 26, verse 5. The wandering Aramean was Jacob. Here, Moses, he's... he's Across the Jordan Valley, looking into the promised land, and they're on the threshold of a new beginning, coming to that promised land. But as they began something new, they looked back and said, we really started small. It was Jacob. He had 12 sons. They went down into Egypt, and they became a nation, mighty and great. Right now, we're, we're just, we're, as a seminary, we're hardly a nation. After wandering as, you know, starting from Jacob in 1983, the founding of the seminary, wandering in the wilderness these last uh, five years as a wandering Aramean. But uh, we confess, and all any true Christian will profess this confession of Hebrews 11:13, that we, like they, are strangers and pilgrims in the earth. We're following God. We recognize. We have no permanent dwelling here, but we look for a city whose foundation and builder is God. And so, 
looking back over the last five years, or looking back over the last 39 years, as long as it's been 39 years since the seminary's been in operation, we recognize that faith lays hold of God, particularly in prayer. Interesting verse, when Peter was in prison in Jerusalem, people were praying for him. Acts 12, verse 5 says, Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So it's not just seminary people. You know, if you're a student, you say, well, I'm, I'm going there uh, to grow in my knowledge of the Word and knowledge of God and how to proclaim it. And uh, not think so much, you know, I, I pay tuition so somebody else can have the burden of prayer. But, uh, you know, if you're part of the seminary family, say, we want to see the work of the Lord succeed here as well as in local congregations, but also in sending out uh, prospective ministers. And so prayer is made by the church. And we believe that really it's been praying people especially in the last five years of, of several congregations in this area, but even across the country, people have been praying for Western Reformed Seminary that it would find a permanent home and that it would grow and find good success. So earnest prayer was made for Peter. And uh, we don't just have a warm thoughts, but we pray to God, just like they prayed for him to God uh, from the church. And that's the message there. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So prayer makes all the difference. And prayer is an expression of our faith. That we lay hold of the invisible God. And we trust him even though we're just going by braille. So what's the next step? Second of all, faith calls us to patience in seeking God's will. We say, God, give me patience. And uh, we know the rest of that, that the Bible says, you want more patience, God will give you troubles tribulations to stretch you to know that you you don't direct your own steps. It's God that directs your steps. And we've got to wait upon God. And that, that waiting upon God, that's where we learn patience and grow in patience. But we know this from Romans 5. The opening verses of Romans 5 say that we're justified by faith. And with that faith, we have peace with God. But then two verses later, it says, suffering produces endurance or patience in some Bible translations. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. If you get, if you get some mileage on you, you get some life experience, uh, you'll have some bumps on the road, and you'll have suffering. But then we endure through the suffering, and once we get that life experience, we say, God has never failed us, and he's teaching us to hope. And faith leads to that hope. And so we just say, you know, God will provide, we just don't know when. And so faith calls us to patience. Thirdly, faith allows us to work with the saints in doing God's work. And we have dedicated people for the operation, of the teaching, and the promotion of the seminary to keep it going because tuition pays 5 or 10% of the cost of doing a seminary. And uh, working with the saints and doing God's work, it, it's, it's a common cause. Uh, it, you know, training leaders is a work of the church. And we see the seminary as an extension of the ministry of our churches. So we want to work with the saints. We, we recognize we need them for their prayer, as they have prayed, and encouragement, and provision they supply. Interesting verse here at the end of Philippians 2, where Paul uh, is in jail in Rome, and Philippi has sent an encourager to Paul while in jail at Rome. Philippians 2.25 says, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger from Philippi, and your minister to my need. So he brings a gift from the church, and he but more than that, he brings, he brings encouragement. Uh, he confirms that, that Paul, you're on the right track. You haven't made mistakes. You, you've not uh, proclaimed the gospel through uh, deceitful words or, or uh, human, human efforts. 
It's all been God. You've given yourself over to God. And that's why Paul can say, Epaphroditus, he's my fellow soldier and fellow worker. And that was great encouragement to Paul to know, just to know that people cared, that people were praying back at Epaphroditus' home church. We have this building here because it's almost like money from heaven. In the uh, Tacoma church, there were twin sisters, and they had worshipped at the Tacoma church, I'm thinking for 70 years, 80 years, maybe 90 years. Because uh, these twin sisters, they lived into their 90s. One twin died at oh, 93 or 4 years of age, one died at 99. But um, uh, they never married. They had each other, and it seemed like they were married to the church. Uh, they, they never missed Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service. They were always there. And they were wise uh, stewards of their time. They were gifted. I mean, they both had skills. Uh, one or both of them served in World War II, you know, in, in the wax or the, the waves. And, uh, but anyway, stewards of their gifts they grew, they grew uh, a, a large you know, investment account. And then they, when they passed from this world, they blessed so many different ministries. And uh, the seminary was one. And uh, what, what they gave was, I think, the amount that they gave was just what this building cost. And it's a beautiful building. And God worked those things together um, and we got the money maybe, I don't know, two or three years before the building came over here. So here's God at work. And we look back as in the proper time, say, what has God done? And now we can see it. But while we're moving forward in the future, it's just, what's the next step? God, we're kind of going by braille here. And faith allows us to work with the saints. And uh, these women gave the money for this building, wanted to see more faithful ministers, so um, their prayers will follow after them. Think of legacy in uh, Revelation 14, says uh, they die and their works do follow after them, and their prayers will follow after them, where we believe that there will be faithful, more faithful ministers coming out year by year. I'm just checking the time here. I want to read a larger section from Numbers, chapter 23. There are three or four Balaam oracles. It looks like four oracles here. Chapter 23 and 24. And the, the wonderful thing, in my mind, is that God is using this crooked stick to draw a straight line. And uh, let me read verse 17 down to 26 in Numbers 23, 17. Balak, the, he's a Moabite king. He comes to Balaam, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering. The leaders of Moab were with him. Balak said to Balaam, What has the Lord spoken? Then Balaam took up his discourse and said, Arise, O Balak, and hear, give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God, and here's the theology. God reveals theology uh, through a mercenary prophet to an unbelieving man. Verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? What God says, he follows through on. God gives a promise, uh, he's going to keep it. And we, hang, we hang on to all the promises of God. 20, Behold, I have received a command to bless. So Balak's hiring him to curse the Israelites down in the valley. And God says, no, 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 you can't do that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. He says, uh, I received a command to bless. When he is blessed, then I cannot revoke it. He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. 
and the shadow of a king is among them. God brings them, brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and Israel what God has done. Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself, it shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. So it sounds like that God will not ever curse these, his own people in the valley. In fact, they're going to have God's power behind them so that they've got the powerful horns of an ox or they've got the uh, strength of a lioness to go after the prey. And that should make Balak, the king of Moab, just shake in his sandals to say, Appears like there's no overcoming it then. Maybe I'll, I'll, have to look, I'll have to look for a different God. I'll look for one of my idols to do something. But probably in the back of his mind, he knew that his idols were just cold, stone, and lifeless. Finally, verses 25 and 6. Balak said to Balaam, well, Then don't curse them at all, nor bless them at all. He says, Well, if you can't curse them, at least don't bless them. Just stop. He says, but Balaam answered and said to Balak, Did I not tell you whatever the Lord speaks? That I must do. This Balaam narrative shows that God can speak warnings through dumb donkeys. He warned Balaam on, on the road to uh, collect his money for prophesying against Israel. Through, he warned Balaam through his donkey. And he also warns Balak through a mercenary prophet. It's interesting, in this section, chapter 22, verse 28, God opened the donkey's mouth. And it's forever, it's forever closed. Every donkey's mouth is forever closed. But if God opens the mouth of a donkey, it cannot help but to utter what God puts in his mouth. God opened that mouth of the donkey. Chapter 22, 31, God opened the eyes of Balaam. So now he can see what the donkey sees. He can see the flaming angel of the Lord standing there with a, with a sword barring the way. Chapter 22, 38, God sends Balaam forward with a confession like a donkey. Quote, can I speak anything at all? The word that God puts into my mouth, that shall I speak. So, he says, he, he's been, Balaam's been put in his place by this flaming angel of the Lord. And he's had a little discussion with him before he meets up with the king of Moab. And so he recognizes that uh, he's on a mission, but it's not Balak's mission. It's God's mission that says, okay, now go ahead, and I'm going to tell you what to say. So in the face of Moab's evil threats against God's people, God overrules to keep his covenant promise to Abraham, which is I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And Moab wants to curse Israel. We may not have uh, a lot of friends uh, on the non-believing side in this world. And it's good if we do, if we can make friends, find common ground with people that deny the faith. But um, we good news is, is that if God has given us promises of blessing, we can hang on to those, and we find that believers will bless other believers. Prayer, encouragement, little gifts, and what a difference it makes. But we don't have to worry about the threatenings and the breathings of those that breathe out the slaughter and threat against Christians. The false prophet gets the dose of reality after his meeting with the angel of the Lord. Cursings of the wicked against the righteous are empty air. They are voodoo pins and just uh, dead dollies. And they are the frustrated beating of pillows of children throwing tantrums. But ultimately, Balaam is God's tool not to curse, but to publicly bless God's people. It's an interesting proverb that says, you know, we don't know where the next gift will come from, but the proverb says, wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Sometimes, sometimes you see that happen. You don't see it all the time, but it does happen. 
maybe it'll happen in your life. And uh, sometimes uh, God sends gifts to uh, the Lord's work from unusual places. But here's where this matter of God told Abraham, I'm going to curse those who curse you. In Numbers 24, God takes his crooked messenger, Balaam, and Balaam is pronounces a curse on those who curse God's people. Here it is in Numbers 24, 17. It's the next chapter after the one I read. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall arise from Israel. And this star in Jacob is the Messiah. But the scepter from Israel shall crush through the forehead of Moab. Moab is wanting to bring not just obstacles, but death to the Israelites in the valley. And at some time, in God's time, uh, they will be the ones who are cursed because they try to curse God's people. According to Genesis 12, verse 3 says, I'm going to curse those who curse you. How wonderful to know that when schemes are hatched and false words are proclaimed, these words have no force unless God is in them, as he was in Balaam's messianic prophecy. Only the words of God will stand. And in our scriptures, we have the words of God. And it's these words of God that we want to know, we want to live by them, and it's the words of the word of God that is life-giving. The entrance of God's word gives light to us. So as we move toward the end, when the Spirit of God commandeers the mouth of this false prophet Balaam, his word reveals the reality of the invisible God to pagans like Balak. And God did commandeer his mouth. He said, um, uh, he's putting these words in Balaam's mouth in Numbers 23.5 and 24.2. says, the spirit uh, takes over uh, Balaam. Takes over his thinking, takes over his words. Say, wow, God, you usually see God using good people. God can use bad people. Doesn't that confirm in our mind that God does work all things together for good? There's, there's no weapon formed against us that can prosper. And here comes Balaam, and he, he thinks, oh, for the right money, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll curse these, these people there. But um, as we read in chapter 23 from the scripture, Balaam was the mouthpiece to teach theology that God is not a man. God can't lie. God can't break his promises, according to verse 19. God's promises can't be overturned by mere humans. You know, they try. Um, they shake their fists at God. Uh, they try to uh, bring mayhem and uh, murder and genocide in different places. But verse, 20, verse 20 of chapter 23 says, God's promises cannot be overturned, nor the blessings. Verse 21 of chapter 23 says that God is Emmanuel. There's more theology. But what's that theology mean? It means that God is, is with us. He's, a, he's among us. He's with the Israelites. He's with us. And our Savior says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. God is with us. That gives us great confidence. And that's what, as we go through trials and we... Um, Endure and persevere, then that leads us to hope. See, God's been with us through, through everything in our lives, in our ministry. And uh, you'll want to remember that Emmanuel promise that God is with you, with the congregation, with the nation, uh, because of the Christians being salt and light uh, in our country. And so, God is the great king in verse 21. And the great king guides and provides his people. There's theology there. And then finally, verse 23 that we started with, what has God wrought? Well, in the proper time, it will be declared what God has wrought. That uh, it's God's time. It's not our timing to determine things. But according to God's will, God's timing, and so we just follow by faith. We, we, we say and pray, God, I'm along for the ride. And I'm laying hold of your promises by faith because you said you'll never leave us nor forsake us, all because you 
you have no true self in Christ. That theology, that's what we live by. It's what God's revealed to us about himself. And theology is where we find eternal life in Christ, God's Emmanuel. So in conclusion, may God, for the many years to come, preserve our school and faith in Christ. He may use the WRS staff and students to lead people in darkness into God's marvelous light. I'm so, so thankful to be able to uh, know that God holds the future. God has provided. We've seen what God has wrought. We're waiting to see what, what will God uh, reveal next. We'll close in prayer. Thank you.